Well, you would never guess where the Voices of the Foothills is originating today. We're sitting here in the kitchen having a cup of tea. Later, we're going to have some deviled eggs and uh, maybe some other little goodies. We're not sure. But uh, I have finally tracked down and caught her uh, away from book signings and speeches and radio programs and uh, newspaper columns. By now, you know I'm talking about Pam Stone. And Pam, it's just great that we've got you here cornered and you're not getting away until you tell us about your life as a glamour girl in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, as, as such a glamour girl as I sit here with my muck boots on or my paddock boots and my riding breeches looking out from your kitchen table at this magnificent view of the foothills. And I think you should call your show um, from my kitchen table. Well, but I'm not always at my kitchen. I could fake it, couldn't I? Yeah, because people love that whole uh, oh, sense yeah. of sitting around with a cup of coffee and uh, just chatting along. But uh, what a lovely house and, and what a lovely host you are. I'm happy to be here. Well, I've been trying to track you down and you've been on book signing. Incidentally, I don't have any turkey butt sandwiches. I should have brought you a copy of Turkey Button. I can't I have believe it. Oh, you I can have, have it. it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I, well, that's fine because I'm a vegetarian, so uh, that, that'll that be just fine. We're not a pure vegetarian because I eat fish and eggs, and I'm looking forward to some deviled eggs from you in a couple of minutes. Um, so um, it's, it's good that you didn't have the Turkey Butt sandwiches. Well, I bought that right away and uh, have read it, and you had signed it already, but I'm going to make you sign it again, and you know, put something like, to my dear friend, Deanie. To, uh, absolutely, absolutely, to uh, to my radio cohort, oh, to yeah, partner well, in crime. Right. Okay, um, before we uh, just get away from completely all this silliness, <laughs> oh, it's fun to be silly. It's, it's the only way to be, I mean, life is too serious. I, a day without a laugh is a day without sunshine. Absolutely. Yeah. I just made that up. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I think, didn't Anita, what's her name? No, it was a day without, it's orange juice is like a day without uh, sunshine. No. Remember Isn't Anita, that... what's her name from far, the Florida campaign, the commercials back in the 70s? She was a Miss America. Yeah, yeah. And then later, very anti, very homophobic, very anti-gay rights. Uh, uh, oh, Anita, people know who I'm talking about. She'd come out and she'd say, Florida orange juice, a day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. What was her? Was it Anita? Should... Yeah, it's her first name. I can't remember the last name. Well, uh, uh, Anita uh, Bryant. Oh. Anita Bryant. There, there we go. There, you there go. we got it. Okay. All right. I go through the alphabet. A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, are you a native Carolinian? Or are you? Uh, where did you originate? <laughs> I was born in Georgia, in uh, the northern part of Georgia, and uh, have lived. Um, I lived very briefly in New Zealand as a child. Uh, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Where? Uh, New Zealand, very briefly oh, oh. for three weeks, and uh, <laughs> then we came. It was very brief, and then we came back. <laughs> so, they didn't like you down there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, my father. Uh, it was during the whole uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, mm-hmm. and my father was very, very nervous. And he was German English, and he wanted to get the hell out of America. And he thought a British Commonwealth like New Zealand would be great. You'd think most men, before uprooting their wife and four kids, might fly out there first and check it out. Out before they no, so it was uh, like Swiss Family Robinson. It was a huge production at my school uh, and the rest of my siblings' school. There was a huge assembly in the auditorium, and we were presented with big cards. And the kids had made these giant signs because we went by ship. You know, this was the last era of of uh, ship travel. Okay, not not cruise ships, but you know, passenger yeah. ships. Big posters, you know, uh, bon voyage to the Stone family, blah, blah, blah. And three weeks later, I'm back in the class. And, <laughs> and the kids and the kids are saying, you know, I thought you went to New Zealand. It's yeah. like, I did, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. My father's an idiot. But well, uh, yeah, uh, that's what happened. They were glad to see you back, no doubt. Huh? Uh, no, they, they thought we were maniacs. But so. you didn't do anything for a party. Yeah, I'd do anything for a party and to get out of school and then just stayed in Georgia um, until I started doing stand-up comedy in 1982. Uh, and I moved to Los Angeles in 1984, and I stayed there till um, 1999, and then okay. came to the Carolinas. When did you find out you were funny? Um, when I was, I always loved making people laugh. And uh, when I was cocktail waitressing at the Punchline Comedy Club in Atlanta, I was putting myself through college, and I took this job at night at the comedy club, you know, carrying drinks, and uh, that way I could ride my horses during the day. You are, of course, I knew it wouldn't be too long before the animals were brought in, because you are quite an animal person, aren't you? Yeah, Yeah. I just uh, 
live, eat, breathe, you know, horses yeah. since I was a kid and uh, I do dressage. And so that's what I do at my farm now. Yeah. So. We'll let you go into that. Maybe you'll have somebody that might want to call and, and uh, learn how to uh, ride a horse or, mm-hmm. or whatever you do. Sure. You know, yeah. you know, but anyway, uh, so you started this then when you were uh, just out of high school, sounds like, and going to college. A funny thing. Well, yeah, but I was putting myself through school, so I would go, um, uh, you know, I'd take one quarter at college and take like two quarters off because I didn't have the money, you know, and I was waitressing to put myself through. By, so I wasn't going straight through, but I did drop out of college at the end of my second year going into my um, junior year to go do stand-up comedy, okay. which a lot of people said, well, you're ridiculous. I mean, that's just crazy. Why wouldn't you not get your degree? And I said, well, I don't want my degree because um, I don't want to have anything to fall back on. Because that way I won't give stand-up my 100% full shot. Do you remember your first uh, time of getting in front of an audience? Uh, that Did they laugh or were you kind of too scared to make them laugh? Do you remember that experience? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. And it's a funny thing because I had waitressed at the punchline for so long. I felt so comfortable in that club. And I so the other waitresses said, you got to get up on open mic night. You're so funny. And so I wrote some jokes and they were all self-deprecatory jokes about being tall and skinny. And I had even been on that stage before at the end of the night, you know, cleaning up and, and taking drinks off the stage and moving the the microphone. So I was so used to that stage. But the first night that I went on, and it was a packed house, absolutely packed, I had not realized, I had never been on the stage when the spotlight was on. I'd been on the stage at the end of the night when lights were turned off and you could see yeah. all the empty chairs in the room. So that really threw me. I walked out and I could not see the audience because the spot was so, so bright. You thought they'd all gone home? I No, I knew they were there, but it was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that I couldn't see anything. This is so strange. You're talking to people and looking out at the crowd like you can see them and you can't see anything. You know, you can see just the people sitting right up front. Do you, I'm, I'm going to keep interrupting you. No, That's fine. Okay. Do you have, does that, is that a part of uh, the way you perform is if you can see a person, see how they're reacting? Yeah, I don't, I, now I don't want to see that, but, but, but then I thought at least I would see these faces. Um, and luckily, I mean, I just killed that night. I mean, I just smoked the room and I've always said that had I bombed that first night, I don't think I would have had the guts to get up and do it again. So uh, it was meant to be for me to have a great set. And I knew immediately, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe the the amount of laughter I was getting. And when I was driving home that night, it was just, you know, that that wonderful feeling when you're in college or, or whatever you've decided to do in life becomes crystal clear that this is what you're going to do for a living for the rest of your life. And I thought this is great because I was looking for a profession where I could work nights and have the daytime free to do my horses and continue training. Did someone hear you? Uh, you know, you always hear these people like Betty Grable was found at the Schweppes soda or, uh, right in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, Schwabs uh, or uh, Schwabs. Schwabs. Uh, drug store, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, you always hear, you know, they're found by somebody. Mm-hmm. Did someone find you or did you find them? Um, a little bit of both. And that's absolutely a great question because um, once I got success, a lot of young and up coming, you know, young and, young and upcoming comedians used to ask me, well, how did you get an agent? Because I'm trying to find an agent and I can't, you know, you know, they keep saying when you get a job, then we'll represent you, but I can't get a job if I don't have an agent. And my stock answer for them is you will get an agent when somebody sees you and figures they can make money from you. That's when you're ready for an agent because an agent makes 10% of whatever you make and a manager makes 15% of whatever you make. And they're generally in the audience different times, you know, looking for talent, scouting out talent. And if they look at you and figure like, uh, you know, but if they start approaching you, then you know that you've got something commercial going on. So you got approached? Yeah, I got approached. I I was with my manager for years and years and years uh, until she actually got out of the business, but, um, and she was wonderful for me. And then, um, when I got the television show, when I got the sitcom, uh, that was absolutely a fluke because the producers were in the audience. And this was at the ice house in Pasadena, which is a marvelous old room where Steve Martin started and the Smothers brothers. And I mean, it just, and music, you know, Peter, Paul and Mary, it just had a wonderful tradition of going way, way back. And um, it was a packed house that night, and the producers were sitting in the audience. They had specifically come to see another female comedian from Texas uh, who was very pretty, very, very pretty girl, very sweet, very nice. And they were writing a pilot about a Southern woman that goes to Washington, D.C. to win a congressional seat or something or a Senate seat. 
And she went on and she um, she didn't bomb. You know, it wasn't like all you heard with crickets, yeah. but she was very weak and didn't do a very good job. And I didn't even know they were in the audience. Did she know they were there? Yeah, because they had specifically come to okay. see her. So that's her probably, that, was a, that was a mistake. Yeah, yeah, and she hadn't been doing stand-up very long, so she wasn't really confirmed in it. You know, yeah. she wasn't rock solid. Yeah. Her material wasn't wasn't that great. And, and um, I, I went out, and I had never had a bad set at the Ice House. The, the audiences there are magical, and the acoustics are incredible. So when you have people laughing, it just bounces everywhere, and it's just contagious. So I went out and just killed. I mean, I just had this fabulous, fabulous set and went back to the green room where my manager was. And then these two producers came in and they said, um, we'd like to talk to you about uh, a pilot that we're writing uh, about this Southern woman that goes, you know, and of course we said, well, sure, we're, we're open to that. And uh, they said, you know, you could be uh, interested, you know, we're, we're kind of considering you yeah. for the role if you were interested. And I said, sure. And they said, but we can't write it until we finish with this mid-season replacement that we got just a couple more episodes to do. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, uh, it's a mid-season replacement called Coach. And I said, oh, I've never heard of it. And he laughed and he said, you and the rest of America. You know, it's, uh-huh. it's like, you know, it's, it's just, it just goes on to, to fit in when another show gets canceled, yeah, you know, those yeah. mid-seasons. So uh, we said, sure, keep in touch, blah, 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 and uh, never heard anything. And that's not too surprising in Hollywood. And then six months later, my manager calls me and she said that... Um, um, Sheldon, who was one of the producers. Sheldon Leonard? Uh, no, Sheldon Bull. Oh. oh. Yeah. So Bull? Sheldon Bull. Bull. And uh, <laughs> he called her and he said, well, um, we would like to talk, have Pam come in and read for a part. And she said, oh, you're writing the pilot for this, you know. Yeah. And he said, no. He said, believe it or not. He said, ABC is just crazy about Coach. So the execs love it. And they've ordered another 13 episodes. We can't believe it. Uh, but they love the idea and they want to, you know, and so they had me come in and read for the part of Judy Watkins. And when I read for the part, um, what was funny is that the show was, it still didn't have a time slot. It was still going to be a mid season replacement and not mm-hmm. seen by anybody. And then as the stars lined up, Roseanne was the number one show in America at the time, Roseanne Barr. And the show that the networks had put in behind Roseanne was a new pilot that they had written for Jackie Mason, the comedian, yeah. and who had a big one man stand up show going on Broadway and was yeah. having this resurrection of his career. And um, Lynn Redgrave, uh, no, oh. no, yeah, Lynn, not Vanessa Redgrave, Lynn, uh, Georgie Girl. Yeah. And the Weight Watchers yeah. commercials. So, and the gist of this sitcom was she's a fiery, redheaded Irish Catholic, and he's this nebbishy New York Jew, and they fall in love, and it's going to be Roman Catholic against, uh, you know, the Jew, mm-hmm. and my insanity will ensue, and it'll be hysterical, and it bombed. It was on, you know, for two episodes, and ABC took it off. And what did they put in? Coach, because it was a mid season replacement. Ah. And the stars were aligned, and overnight, we went to number two in the ratings. And the show went on for another nine years, and I was a part of it for seven years. So it was just, I went from being a complete unknown, and I had done a little bit of stand-up on television, doing some television appearances as a stand-up, um, but I went from just being well-known on the stand-up circuit touring to overnight 30 million people seeing me. And, and in the 90s, um, before the internet was such a strong force, that was the audience share. I mean, when Seinfeld first hit, I mean, it regularly had an audience in the 20s, yeah. you know, 20 odd million people. And now today, because the internet is such a fierce competitor, yeah. um, a show is considered a top 10 show if, you know, 9 million people are watching. Yeah. So uh, in so many ways, uh, everything just lined up and, and couldn't have been any better. Yeah. Well, it's like you drew a, a road map and followed it. You went to, mm-hmm. I, you, you were sunny and down here. Uh, I, I'll back up just a minute for one one quick question. <clears throat> you left from down your little place Georgia. down in Georgia, mm-hmm. and you went to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Or, okay, uh, what prompted that? Oh well, I knew that's where at that time. That's where it was. <laughs> yeah, well, that's where it was. You either went to New York or L.A. as a stand-up comic if you wanted to come up the ranks um, and. At that time, stand-up comedy was so hot in America. I mean, every tiny town had a comedy club. And the network executives were figuring out that, hey, you know what? These stand-up comedians do really good with sitcoms. 
You know, yeah. Seinfeld, Roseanne, Bill Cosby, I mean, uh, Tim Allen, all these stand ups, the networks were just throwing deals at them, uh-huh. holding deals, yeah. so that you went to where it was going on and they were actively l- scouting the clubs and looking. So that's, you, that's why I went there. And it was so funny because I moved there the day I arrived in West Hollywood, which has a huge gay population. Um, was Gay Pride Day, and I had no idea. So I, so I'm all, you know, I've just driven across country, um, and I get to Santa Monica Boulevard, and it's closed off, and with police, and you just see floats going by, and some guy that looks like Ed Asner dressed as Carmen Miranda with fruit on his head, and 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 you know, guys dressed as, you know, it was so funny, and I thought, and here I was, little Southern what country am I doing here? like, like what the heck is it? You know, all this, and and it was the safest place for you know, some straight Single girl, girl to live. Yeah. I mean, everybody in my apartment was was gay. And it was just a wonderful, moving to Hollywood, moving to Los Angeles at the age of 24, oh, 25, was the best thing I ever did as a human being because I grew up in a very lily white, safe neighborhood. How'd your parents feel about you? Was your father still living then? My father was still living, but he had moved to England by that time and he had never seen my stand up. And my mother, mm-hmm. my mother is an artist and she was always very, very supportive and excited about my career because it was something creative, right, you know, right. and, and um, so she was excited by that. But it was just fabulous to get out of, you know, white Southern Georgia and live on a street where, you know, my landlord was a Russian Jew and next door to me was an Ecuadorian and, you know, there's a gay black guy above me and, and you know, living upstairs and who knows who else downstairs and you go and you stand in line at the bank and you're the only white person in line, you know, Caucasian European, Northern European white mm-hmm. and the same thing with the tellers and it was just great to be thrown into this melting pot of different ethnicities and to turn right out of my apartment building and I could go eat at an Ethiopian restaurant or a Greek restaurant. And it was, you know, I had traveled the world yeah. prior to this. Yeah. I had traveled the You'd world. You lived in New Zealand for I, three for weeks. three weeks, <laughs> baby. But, but I had never lived in a city and I had never, it, and it was just wonderful to be out of my little lily white comfort zone and embrace all these different cultures and find out at the end of the day that people are people and, and everybody wants the same thing. Would you think that if you would make that move today, if you were back to 24 years old and so mm-hmm. forth, you think it would be the same out there today as it was then? Sure. Yeah, it, absolutely. It, California yeah. is kind of a world of its own, isn't it? I, it? Yeah, it is a world of its own. And it was dangerous then and it's dangerous today. And there was a lot of crime then. And, and you just used a lot of common sense and looked twice and where you were going and made yourself aware of neighborhoods that were scary. And But it was a great time. I mean, to be... To live in a city like that or Manhattan when you're in your 20s and the club scenes and the bars and all your friends are young and single and you're all going to the clubs and I mean, the people that I was hanging out with at that time, we were all coming up together. You know, I'm sitting next to Jim Carrey in the back of the club, and he's telling me he's not, you know, he feels like his career is not going anywhere. And, you know, Dennis Miller and Jay Leno's on stage. I mean, you're, you know, I I mean, when I think back about that time, I I realized how privileged I was, you know, to be with this massive talent. I was going to say, any any people that you were kind of thrown in with at that time Mm -hmm. uh, have... Well, you've mentioned Dennis Miller, and uh, for one, mm-hmm. uh, that has uh, that made it big. Mm-hmm. That you got to know pretty well, and and thought them as being a, a nice human being instead of just a show off. Um, well, I knew them all before I moved there because they knew me from waiting tables at the punchline comedy club and then we worked together i mean my second gig ever on the road was working three weeks straight uh with jay so i was his opening act jay leno for for three weeks and he was very good to me in my career as soon as he took over the tonight show he put me on is he the same now as he was when you knew him I mean, um, I mean, I don't mean... Yeah, um, the, the essence of his personality, okay. the essence of his personality yeah. um, is is the same. I mean, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of Jay that... And, and I know there's people out there in the business that aren't very kind to him. But all I can say is um, he was very, very good to me. He well, was, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I, I have a lot of people that... I call a friend that people say, oh, really? You know, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Like, oh, re-. they don't have, you know, right. three heads or anything like mm-hmm. that. But there's, I, I, I'm sometimes attracted to all these 
stranger, mm-hmm. or not strange, but different people, people right. that have um, th- a little something. Yeah, yeah. That's why I guess, you, uh, I just noticed something. I think you and I have the same color eyes. Kind of hazel? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. It must be something. There's something in the air. There, uh, it's a radio thing, I mm-hmm. guess. But anyway, my radio is... is uh, uh, just a small town gal with a lot of gab, but I, I had an interesting time and met a lot of people. It's funny when you're in the, uh, when you were in the entertainment business, I was in the communication business. But it's amazing how your paths will cross mm-hmm. with people that you read about in the paper, oh, sure. and you just kind of you know in awe. At least I'm still a small town girl, and I still oh, yeah. am in awe of people that that um, um, have made it. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of them that have made it that I wouldn't walk across the street to talk to, sure. of course. But anyway, but they would have been. But those people, I found because there was a few of those same kind of people in stand-up comedy that went on to be enormous stars, and those those personalities that you're talking about, they would have been that way if they had uh, decided carpenter. to be a plumber. Yeah, they yeah. still would have been a pain in the butt. Yeah. you know, they they still would have. I I just find. Um, it's such a it's thinking back it's a very fond fond memory and i just read steve martin's um autobiography and about his early days of stand-up because nobody was bigger than steve martin in the early days i mean he was selling out uh madison square garden and just uh, he was selling out arenas which is unheard of for a stand-up comic it's usually you know bands that do that and he wrote the book he said to reintroduce himself to that young man who was so successful because his life changed so dramatically. I mean, he got so big in stand up that he stopped doing it because he couldn't get any bigger than he was. And he turned much more to, you know, to acting, to doing movies and writing. And he's written several plays and books. And he said, I just kind of wanted to reacquaint myself with who was that kid in the white suit with the arrow through his head on stage? You know, who was that guy? And I really get that because when I think back in my career, um, I think of the people I've worked with, and it didn't hit me until I was watching a show on PBS about uh, American pioneers of comedy. And they did this special. It was wonderful. It was footage on, you know, Bob Hope and Milton Berle. uh, Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason. And I sat there, and I was watching it for about 20 or 30 minutes before it dawned on me. I have worked with every single person that they've shown so far. I have worked with all the. I did a. I did a young comedian special on NBC that Bob Hope hosted. Milton Berle made an appearance on that. I I worked with Milton before that. I worked with Jackie Vernon. I worked with Henny Youngman. Jackie Gleason. Uh, no, he oh, was okay. dead by the time I. Oh, yeah, he was oh, gone. But you know I these. Love that man. But these yeah, huge, yeah. these huge, huge yeah. stars, and you realize how successful they were because they made. They made the jump from vaudeville stand up to radio, and then the massive change from radio to television and then to film. So, I mean, it's that speaks of the height of their ability and their stardom because right now we're competing with the internet. And if you're clever, you figure out a way to make that your friend as well. But so I look back at my stand up career, which I, I do very little stand up now. I just do corporate dates, usually private corporate dates, and I do benefits. But I look at back at it with a lot of fondness and a lot of, uh, I just realized I was so privileged. Well, we're privileged to have you here uh, in this area, and that's one thing I usually ask our guests because I started doing this because of all the interesting people I've met since mm-hmm. moving here from Ohio. You know what a Buckeye is? Uh, I, well, an actual Buckeye is a nut, isn't it? Uh-huh. Oh, it's a okay. useless nut. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, okay, right. say no more. Yeah, I, well, okay. you're selling I, yourself I, short. I, hello, now. hello. But um, since moving here, mm-hmm. and I volunteered to, at the St. Luke's Thrift Shop, uh-huh. and through that, that just by volunteering a, a few hours a week down there, has opened the world to this place here has people in it from all over the world. Yes, it does. And I ask them a lot of times when I say, oh, are you a native? Uh well, no, we moved. Well, mm-hmm. why would you, you know, mm-hmm. what? we have a, a one-way street, yeah. and, you know, and a couple traffic lights. Yeah. It's small, but it's a little Cincinnati. We have so much here That's because right. of the people who make it mm-hmm. up, people like yourself. There are people here that have been in Washington, that have been in the government, mm-hmm. people in the entertainment field. You and I think there's an actress here. I mm-hmm. won't mention her name yet, but I'm going to try to get her on. But we have people that have, um, uh, you know, authors, artists, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth. Why? What brought you here? 
Well, I mean, the same thing that brought everybody else here. This is kind of a number one destination point for retirees. I mean, people love people want to go to the Carolinas because they want four seasons, but they don't want it too cold, or, you know, or too hot. But uh, what brought me here was I wanted to move back to Georgia. I was looking for property or farm for my horses, but every place that I grew up in Georgia or knew had been paved over, and it was nothing but you know strip malls and McMansions and these tacky developments. And I thought. I want to find a little town that's in no danger of being overdeveloped, that's in the middle of nowhere in the countryside. And I almost put an offer on a small farm in Kentucky. And uh, Paul, my other half, said, ah, it's really hard winters there. It's going to be yeah. real tough oh, yeah. taking care of those horses in the morning, you know, mucking out and feeding. And then I almost put an offer in a place in Ocala. And Paul's from Florida. And he said, I'm telling you, there's only going to be three months out of the year you're going to be able to ride and not sweat like a horse. And so I looked at the Carolinas. And when I first found Landrum, um, I first bought property in Landrum in 1987. And this was a closed town. It was broke. And every there wasn't there was one place to eat that was open for like four hours out of the day. And there was the Pizza Hut. And every other shop was closed. And we had the hardware store. It was just, you know... It, Look at it now. Yeah. Well, 26 was really new. But prior to that, there was no real interstate yeah, yeah. coming in. And then Doug Brandon became mayor. And some people moved in. Um, the Andersons, when they were married, moved in from, I believe, Charleston or Hilton Head and opened up cottage cafes and the gift shop, which has since left us now. But all of a sudden, the town just boomed. And then you had people in New York that were saying it's too damn cold here. And people in Florida that lost their places to hurricanes. And they all started coming here. So... My only concern is um, this place losing its native southern feel because um, Tryon in particular has such a huge heritage of horsey people and internationally famous horsey people going back, you know, to the 40s. I mean, this was a place where the United States uh, equestrian team did their training you know, under Gordon Wright. Yeah, there are more horses and people here. Well, yeah, there certainly, there certainly are. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I've often wondered, you know, what people, but you are from the area, and but I've known people that have uh, moved, well, just this past week, mm -hmm. uh, a couple came in that had lived here, and then they moved away. I don't remember where they moved to, mm -hmm. but they're looking for a place to buy back. Coming they back. want to come back. Yeah. So I, I say it's a dot on the map, but it's crossroads of the world. Well, you're, that's a great way to put it. And I find, what I tell people, people that come to visit, me here and immediately they start looking at real estate because they want you know they get share they got bit by the bug and I tell them boy you better just make sure that you're you have come to term with the demons in your head because when you live in a city if you're a little restless you know there's a lot of distractions you can go out to several different restaurants you can go to bars you can go out to see live theater shows you ain't got that here well, we have theater well, and we have music. Well, not, uh, not on that level, you know oh, what no, I'm oh, saying? No. We've got wonderful things, but but you can't go out, you know, try on rolls up the sidewalks at 9 p.m. Listen, I mean, come on, New Year's Eve, they throw the ball over the clock tower at 9.30 uh, yeah, because yeah. nobody can stay up to midnight? Right. Come on. So, so that's what I tell my friends, saying... I don't want, because I've heard this from a couple of people that have moved here, and, and it does incur my wrath. People will move here because there's no traffic, because it's open, it's a beautiful small town, and then they start whining after a year like, well, I can't believe I have to drive half an hour to get to a Home Depot, and it's so far from a Walmart, and I said, that is the sacrifice you make. But that's the Sparky. pleasure of living here. Well, that's what you tell them, and they still whine and moan, and then I'm like, get the hell out of here. Move, it, move to Greenville, move to Asheville, go somewhere where you've got, Got you know, all that noise. and. Yeah. Uh, but we're close enough for things. If you have to go someplace in a hurry, we're close to airports. We're close yeah. to shopping centers. They want to go to Walmart and Lowe's or wherever. Yeah. They can go. I'm just glad we're stuck here where you can walk down the street, speak to people. Yep. The little gang down at the sidewalk cafe where That's they right. sit down there and solve the problems of the world. Mm -hmm. But we have everything that you want for uh pleasurable things yeah and those other things to me are not pleasurable when you have to fight for a parking place oh my gosh yeah, yeah when the traffic dictates what choices you make yeah. and that happened to be in los angeles i mean it got to the point where you know friends would call and say do you want to go out and have uh dinner and you'd been in your car all day already and you just thought i just can't face getting back out in traffic we're yeah. going to sit in traffic an hour just to get into brentwood which should be 10 minutes up the road 
Because, you know, the, the joke in Los Angeles was always everything's 20 minutes away. Mm. It never was. Oh, 20 minutes from what? But yeah, yeah, 20 <laughs> minutes. It was like, oh, well, if you need to go into the Valley, if you need to go to Universal Studios, you know, it's just 20 minutes from West Hollywood. And if you need to go to the airport, you get on La Siena, go 20 minutes. If you want to go to the beach, 20 minutes. If you want to go to the mountains, 20 minutes. It's the biggest lie on the planet. Everything is 20 minutes from here. Everything. Well, maybe 25. Yeah, yeah. To Spartanburg or yeah, to your home yeah, depot. Well, we have great medical facilities. Do you know that we have a, one of the top four cancer centers in the country right here in Spartanburg? I did not know that. Oh, I was down there, honey, and they took good care of me. Well, I know there's some great urologists up in Rufton because uh, I haven't been to one, but every sign I see up there is a urologist sign. But the, it's, uh, we have a, a hospital here locally that that it's good to have a facility as complete as it is, but mm-hmm. uh, hardly any hospital is for everything. Sure. But uh, we're close enough that if you have a bad problem, they can get you they there in a bye darn and hurry. Move you on. That's right. 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 So, you know, we could sit here and go, I, we're going to have to do this again. We're going to have to do it again because, number one, I want some of the deviled eggs you've made for me because they're well, famous. That's all, they're the reason world I, famous. The only way I could get her here was to promise her deviled said, eggs. I'm crazy about them. Oh, so. I was going to make you a pie, but I thought I don't want to overdo it. Yeah, one it. of those, uh, what do you call it? Paper bag. Paper bag pies. Yeah, That's yeah. a new one for me. I would yeah, really love yeah. a paper but, bag uh, pie. I just, after I did the eggs, I was exhausted. You're exhausted. That's fine. Yeah, Can but, you do a paper bag egg, or is there no point? Uh, I've done eggs about every way, but paper bag. I'll try one sometime, just for you. Just for the heck of it. I'll, just, I'll put it in the bag and put it in the oven and see yeah, what happens. Something to brag about. I, I exploded one a few weeks ago in the oven. I, wow. It wasn't done, and I thought, well, shell was off. I'll put it in the oven and see if I can just finish it. Yeah. Up. Oh, it, it, it got finished. It yeah. exploded. I had to clean the whole microwave oven. When you're, when you're using the uh, alarm, the smoke alarm, as a timer, and when you have to wipe off the ceiling, generally that means That's a side. little... It yeah, sounds like maybe, you do that from experience. Yeah, you might just want to order in. Yeah. Do all these things really... Ha- oh, that's another program. I'm going to find out <laughs> if all these things that you write about... Are, oh, there's one thing I want to, tell, sure. uh, wanted to remind you of. In your book... Mm-hmm. What, what, now, what is your book again? I want me a I love turkey, me a turkey, turkey butt, butt sandwich. sandwich. Okay. That's... that's that's another story. Oh, the telephone. I wonder who that could be. Anyway, um, but there's one line in your book that I, I laughed out loud when I read it about the, and then we'll close with this. Okay. What, in the nightclub one night you were appearing, oh, yeah. and you were talking about this man that, mm-hmm. um, did he have on dark glasses? Yeah, he looked like Richard Petty. Was This was in oh, yeah. uh, Texas. Okay. It was in, I think it was in Austin or Arlington, Texas. And he was sitting right up front, and he had about 10 empty Budweiser long net bottles on the table in front of him. He was just him, not him and a date. And he's sitting there with a cowboy hat and dark glasses. <laughs> and I said, you know, what do you do? You know, I looked down and he's drunk all this beer and he's got these dark, dark Richard Petty glasses. And I said, what are you doing wearing dark glasses in a nightclub? And he just looked at me and said, I'm blind. And he gestured <laughs> down to he had his guide dog that was asleep under his chair. Oh. And it was just that horrible silence and the audience is sweating. like It's just so awkward. And and I just, I said, well, if, if you're the one who drank all that beer, I hope he's driving, you know, meeting yeah, the dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just roared his head back and laughed. And he was great. And he came up to me after the show and said, that he really appreciated being picked on. Didn't he give you a back line? Though? Yeah, he did. He said, uh, he said, um, he said, you know, when you have, when you have, when you're not like anybody else, people ignore you because they don't want to offend you. And he said, you you must know that feeling being so freakishly tall. Oh. <laughs> and I said, okay, oh, yeah, oh, all right, God. thank you. And he could oh, tell just from talking oh. to me, my voice was coming up from so high. Oh, so but, it was but, great. But you never know when you're doing that. You you were living dangerously when you get up in front of an audience because they can make you your life miserable if yeah. you don't come across. Well, you've made my life fun today. I uh, My tea got cold. I got so interested in listening to you that I didn't even, wasn't very good tea to begin with. But, oh, I like mine. Oh, no, did you? Well, you drank it all, so I, I hope it was all right. But anyway, well, we'll have some deviled eggs now, and we hope you'll join us again for another one of our Voices of the Foothills. The Try On Daily Bulletin is making all this possible, and uh, we want to thank Pam Stone for making a fun time possible, and uh, we hope to hear from you, and let us know what you're thinking about this. Is anyone interesting you'd like to hear uh, get on and talk about their experiences? Let us hear from you, but meanwhile, we'll get Pam back here, maybe with some deviled eggs or a paper bag pie, and we hope you'll join us. So until the next time, then, we hope all of you have a real good day.